I'm actually somewhat frightened by the implications of what is being said in this video. And what's truly alarming is that giants like Microsoft, closely associated with Bill Gates, of course, are already establishing a monopoly on this. Elon Musk also seems deeply interested. If you look right now in science, we have billions of magnetite crystals in our heads. But yet, you and I can't navigate the Earth without GPS. Why is that? Our, now, our magnetite crystals are still tracking Earth's magnetic field. We are completely unaware of it. They took a person, put him into a room, put a giant bar magnet over their head, and put a, put a cap on their head to track the, the, the crystals or orientation. The crystals were tracking the orientation of the magnet. We, still, we should be able to navigate like turtles and birds do and so forth and else, but we don't have the ability to because why? We've lost our, our conscious awareness of what's already happening inside of us. Then we have a lot of junk DNA. I don't believe it's junk. I believe that that DNA used to be connected and that now it's been disconnected by some artificial force, which has disconnected us from a lot of our natural, everyday birthright given uh, abilities. What scientists say is junk DNA is just extra DNA that they have no idea what it's for. It's just kind of laying there, laying around, but it's not used for anything whatsoever. It just happens to just be in the body, but it's totally useless and not plugged into anything. Okay. But in my opinion, it's supposed to be plugged into something. It's supposed to be connected. It's supposed to be active. And, uh, you know, we know that DNA is a storage medium of information. A scientist named George Church took his ebook, which was... Um, I forget how many pages it was, a few hundred pages, even multimedia stuff in the book. He then transmitted that book from a computer onto DNA. And then he was able to transmit it back from the DNA back up to the server again into the book. He replicated and then 80 billion times the book. He replicated on his computer 80 billion times and then put it on the DNA and it fit in, the, in one drop. One gram of DNA can hold over 433 petabytes of data. So they said, wait a minute, this is crazy. So Microsoft started experimenting with this too. So they were able to take data, zeros and ones, convert it into A's, C's, T's and G's, which is what read, write is on our DNA, and then put the data in a volume on DNA and then take the data from the DNA and move it back into, from A's, C's, T's and G's into zeros and ones and put it back on another computer. So now they have made a working DNA hard drive, which now, you can store immense amount of information. They estimate that one human body can store 13.5 billion years of data. Wow. And how old is the universe? I have no idea. 13.5 billion years. Everything that exists, everything that's happened since the beginning of time is stored inside of your individual body and minds as well. So many major companies are getting into DNA storage and even Elon Musk is talking about it. You can basically do anything with the uh, Synthetic uh, RNA, DNA. Um, it's really, it's like a computer program. So, I mean, I think with enough with with uh, with effort, that's not too crazy. You could probably stop aging, reverse it if you want. Um, uh, these are you can basically do it. You can turn someone into a freaking butterfly if you want with the right DNA sequence. This just goes to show that ideas which seemed like pure sci-fi or something out of an esoteric tale just a few years ago are now becoming reality. Just think about it. Scientists have figured out how to store data on DNA. That's pretty wild, right? It kind of makes you wonder, are we like robots? Is this the matrix? What I mean is, you might have thought the first part of this video sounded a bit out there, but here we are, seeing these once far-fetched ideas start to materialize. It often takes seeing these concepts discussed in mainstream media for most people to start believing it's actually possible. I really think we need to take a moment to reflect on what we've just heard. This isn't just about technology evolving. It's about a shift in our understanding of what's possible, pushing the boundaries of our reality. What seemed improbable yesterday is coming to life today. We're a walking universal library. We are the way for the universe to figure out and explore the third dimension and understand what it's like to be and live in the third dimension as every individual living thing. And we're all connected through this quantum entanglement. Every single, every single thing that exists is all connected, still connected. Space is an illusion. Distance is an illusion. Separation is all an illusion. Space, as we usually understand it, might actually be an illusion. This idea isn't just some philosophical thought. It's grounded in serious scientific theories from quantum mechanics to string theory. 
In the realm of quantum theory, we see something called entanglement, where particles remain interconnected no matter how far apart they are. Einstein famously dubbed this spooky action at a distance, suggesting that our usual ideas about spatial separation don't really apply at the quantum level. Particles can affect each other instantly across vast distances without anything physically linking them. String theory takes this further, proposing that our entire reality springs from vibrations of one-dimensional strings at the subatomic level. These tiny strings, which exist in multiple dimensions, vibrate in such specific ways that they give birth to every particle and force in the universe. This theory leads us to a wild possibility. Our whole universe might actually be a kind of hologram, emerging from a two-dimensional surface that holds all the data and laws of physics we experience in three dimensions. According to the holographic principle, all the information in a given space can actually be represented on a boundary surrounding that space. This supports the idea that space isn't a fundamental aspect of reality, but rather a construct that emerges from these deeper, more foundational processes. However, I think Billy Carson explains this even better in the next segment. We appear to be sitting in two separate chairs with a space in between us, mm -hmm. but we're all atoms on an energetic grid that's connected and has always been connected. So the space in between us appears to be a distance, but if you go on the quantum level, you discover that we're both local. We're still in the same position, which is the original position. This entire universe is made up of a complete holography. We're living in a fractal holographic matrix, a matrix of light. And it doesn't take away from there being a creator because what I'm telling you about is the method used of this to make this creation. The method is a fractal holographic matrix, a matrix of light. Quantum physicists will tell you that a human being exists both as a wave of light and also solid matter. And they got the first image of a wave converting into solid matter on a, on a special type of camera. This is in physics.org. So in wave particle duality, they discovered that everything in the entire universe exists first as waves of light until a conscious observer interacts with it and then it collapses. This is hard to wrap your mind around, but imagine this. We're sitting here, your house, it exists as a wave of potentials, not your house, it's a wave of light. Now the construction technique of the stacking of those atoms that built your house has a specific resonant frequency. So no matter who looks at it, it always collapses into the same exact shape. But if nobody's looking, it's just a wave of potentials. Until you see it, when you bend the corner, it collapses back into a solid structure. This is now well known proven science due to the double slit experiment. If you look that up, you'll find out they took a microscopic box. They put a little gun inside that can shoot individual electrons through slits inside the box to sit, to hit the back wall. So the two slits here, and they want these particles to hit the back wall to see if it was going to make a digital imprint on the back wall. Well, when they did this, when they looked, it was waves. So they said, wait a minute, how can there be a wave pattern on the back wall? We shot individual single electrons through the slits. There should be dot, 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 dot. I said, we got to look at this and see what's going on. So they put a camera in the box to see what was happening. When they looked, just looking, all of a sudden the electron said, oh, you're looking at me? Okay, I'm going to go back to being solid matter now. Dot, 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 dot. Took the camera away, waves. Put the camera back, dot, 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 dot. Oh, electrons are conscious. They, they are aware that they're being observed. And electrons orbit every atom in the universe, which means every atom is conscious. That means you think that you're sitting in a chair that's just made by man. We didn't make this chair. We stack atoms. We stack conscious atoms in a format that allowed us to sit on them. Everything is conscious. This chair is conscious. This suit is conscious. Everything is conscious because they're all made of atoms. And all we are ourselves are a stack of conscious atoms observing ourselves right now. What's coming next may just be the most fascinating part of this entire discussion. Electrons are conscious. They, they are aware that they're being observed. And electrons orbit every atom in the universe, which means every atom is conscious. That means you think that you're sitting in a chair that's just made by man. We didn't make this chair. We stack atoms. We stack conscious atoms in a format that allowed us to sit on them. Everything is conscious. This chair is conscious. This suit is conscious. Everything is conscious because they're all made of atoms. And all we are ourselves are a stack of conscious atoms observing ourselves right now. Yes, electrons are conscious. And Billy Carson is onto something big here. Science backs him up too. 
Quantum mechanics tells us that particles like electrons behave differently when they're being observed. It's as if they're aware of our attention. This phenomenon is famously highlighted in the double slit experiment, where electrons change their behavior based on whether they're being watched, acting like waves when unobserved, and like particles when observed. But what holds all of this together? Electromagnetic forces. That's what holds us together. You don't touch anything. So I may look like I'm touching this chair right now, right? I'm not actually touching the chair. You actually never touch anything. The repulsion of the electromagnetic frequency orbiting the electrons and atoms in my hand are repelling the ones inside the chair, creating a repulsive force, not allowing my hand to pass through the chair because honestly, atoms are 99.999% empty space. And so what that means is atoms are mostly empty. There's nothing there. The only thing we have is these electromagnetic fields that give us the illusion of separation and, and solidity. And so if I can obtain the atomic frequency of the vibration of the atoms in this chair and make my hand match that frequency, I would pass my hand right through the chair like it didn't even exist. Now let's push this idea even further. If electromagnetic forces are what keep us from actually touching anything, creating a kind of invisible buffer around everything, then consider the implications of mastering these forces. Billy Carson introduces a captivating concept here. He suggests that if we could learn to match the frequency of the atomic vibrations of objects, we could literally pass through them as if they weren't there. Consider the quantum superposition principle from physics. This principle claims that particles like electrons can exist in multiple states simultaneously, a concept that's integral to understanding quantum mechanics. When applied to Billy's discussion, this principle suggests that if we could control or align our vibrational state to match that of another object, much like particles in superposition, we could potentially choose the state in which we interact with that object, be it solid or permeable. This resonates with the idea that by mastering the frequencies at which atoms vibrate, we can manipulate the physical reality those atoms construct. The quantum superposition principle helps explain the potential for such seemingly magical capabilities, underscoring the notion that the universe at a fundamental level is defined not by fixed states, but by probabilities and possibilities contingent on observation and interaction. So there's probably people that have learned this technique. We're gonna match the frequency of this wall and just walk right through. Imagine a military puts on a special suit that can match the frequency of a solid, solid concrete wall and walk right through the wall. It's gonna look like magic, but it's just technology, you see? They understand how to match frequencies. If I took all eight billion people on Earth and took away the empty space in their atoms, I can fit every human being into one sugar cube. There's nothing here. <laughs> We're not even here. We're not even here. What does this mean in the context of our everyday reality? If we dive into the physics of our existence, it turns out that the atoms that make up our bodies are almost entirely empty space. Billy illustrates this concept with a fascinating analogy. If you could remove all the empty space from the atoms of every human on Earth, you could compress the entire population into the volume of a single sugar cube. This staggering image highlights just how insubstantial our physical forms are and challenges our perceptions of solidity and presence. This leads to an even more profound implication. What we perceive as our physical selves is mostly an illusion, crafted by the forces of nature like electromagnetism that dictate the interactions of these almost entirely empty atoms. Our true essence, the part that interacts, thinks, and experiences, might just be something far less tangible than we ever imagined. If you go into a laboratory and you take two particles, and you use a laser with something called parabolic down conversion, you can get those particles on the same frequency. Once you get those particles to vibrate at the same frequency, you can entangle them. Once they're entangled, what happens is, let's say they were atoms, right? Mm -hmm. Atoms all have spin rates. So you can get one the spinning rating up and the other one is spinning down and they're entangled. If I take the atom that's spinning down, and take it to the other end of the galaxy, or the other end of the universe for that matter, if I had the capability, if I was to make the one local to me spin up, the one that's down will go up and vice versa. I can utilize that to send rudimentary communication through ups and downs, zeros and ones, right? So you have this entanglement that happens which bypasses the speed of light, it bypasses space time. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance, right? So now what scientists discovered later on is that our thoughts 
phase in and out of this dimension, our synapses between our neurons and our own brain. They disappear sometimes and go where? They say that they're going and entangling with information in other dimensions, other places, and also the capability for people to manifest things and attract things into their life. A lot of the times I believe that these way that you're thinking and focusing your mind, your, your brain, your, your, your conscious energy, it becomes a magnet. So if you look at Einstein's theory of relativity and you look at a planet, you'll see that a planet warps space around it. That's why gravity happens. Things fall toward the mass because space is warped, it's bent. Replace that planet with your consciousness. Now that's warping the ether of this, uh, this metaverse. And what's happening is things are falling toward you when you focus on them. The things that you want to bring into your life, negative or positive, whatever you focus on is, fall, is falling toward you. A lot of the times I believe that part of that falling toward, the initiation of it, is an entanglement. When you start to focus your mind heavily on a specific thing that you want to manifest into your life or bring into your reality, somehow those synapses entangle with something in the universe then the universe says, send this his way, send this her way, and it begins to fall toward you. And this is how I believe on the spiritual level, this ability for us to attract things into our life and attract our realities into our life based on what we're focusing on conscious thought happens. Billy Carson dives deep into the concept of quantum entanglement, shedding light on how everything might be more connected than we ever thought possible. He describes how particles, once linked, can instantly affect each other across vast distances. Einstein called this spooky action at a distance, hinting at the profound ways our thoughts and actions could reach far beyond our immediate surroundings, possibly tapping into forces science is just starting to grasp. Building on this, let's look at how cutting-edge scientific theories like string theory suggest there are unseen dimensions interacting with our own. These hidden layers of reality might be where entangled particles are chatting away carrying messages across the cosmos. If our consciousness can tap into these dimensions, much like entangled particles seem to do, it could explain some pretty wild human experiences. Think about those moments of deja vu, unexplained intuitions, or the uncanny accuracies of some mystics and psychics. These aren't just quirks of the human mind. They might be glimpses into a much bigger picture. Moreover, the world of quantum computing is showing us this isn't just theoretical. Quantum computers use principles like superposition and entanglement to perform tasks way faster than our standard computers ever could. This not only proves such states are real, but also showcases how they can be harnessed, hinting at the practical magic of these hidden dimensions. Our mind is connecting to up to 11 dimensions, which is pretty interesting. So as you're focusing on things, you could even be connecting to information in higher dimensions. Could it be that some psychics, mystics, right, Edgar Casey, who would who would go into this type of a half days and tap into information to give people cures for their illnesses and diseases that would actually work? Could he be tapping into quantum entangled thoughts that exist? He said he would send his mind out into the universe to get the answer because the answers already exist and he would get the answer back. So in some way, I believe we're all entangling with information throughout the universe. It's just that sometimes we don't discern what that information is and some people who seem to have these special abilities are able to discern the information as it comes back in, analyze it, and then it can actually even speak on it or utilize it in some way, shape, or form. What do you think about the information Billy Carson shared? Is it just science fiction, or could it actually be factual? Many of his claims have a basis in science, which really makes you wonder, where does that leave us? DNA as a data storage medium? Electrons that are conscious? It appears that escaping the matrix isn't the goal, as often discussed. Instead, perhaps we should aim to master it by deeply understanding our essence and realizing our potential. This discussion seems to always bring us back to the great Nikola Tesla and his timeless quote, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. This was a fantastic podcast by Sean Ryan, and I highly encourage you to check it out. I'll leave all the links in the description below so you can watch the entire interview. There are many insightful discussions there, and it's definitely worth your time. Until next time, keep listening, keep growing, and keep shining. Stay blessed.